So thank you everybody for joining. We are live streaming on YouTube for the COVID Info Commons Research Webinar. And we also have people in the webinar with us. So thank you everyone who's tuning in today. And feel free to share the link for the YouTube with your friends. And I think we're ready to get started. I'm gonna kick this off because I wanna thank our new operations manager and, and introduce her to everybody. So my name is Florence Hudson and I'm the executive director for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. And I'm also co-PI on the COVID Information Commons, which is a rapid award that we received last year from the NSF Convergence Accelerator Program. And it's a collaborative um, partnership between the four NSF Big Data Innovation Hubs in the United States, the Northeast Hub, the South, the West, and the Midwest. You're joining us today for the series, the COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. We started these a year ago uh, when we announced and launched the COVID Info Commons. So we will um, be happy to have you join us today for our monthly webinars. You can always go to covidinfocommons.net to try out the kick. And uh, we look forward to you having an active participation in our call today. So what I wanted to do is introduce Lauren Close, and this is Lauren's first kick webinar. And actually it was just her one month anniversary with the Northeast Big Data Hub this week. So we're delighted with the way she's just jumped in and helped us with everything. So Lauren, welcome um, as our new operations and communications manager and leading these kick webinars. So I'll pass it on to you. Well, thank you, Florence. Um, I'd like to echo Florence's earlier comments. Welcome everyone to the July COVID Info Commons Research Webinar. My name is Lauren Close. I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub at Columbia University and an enthusiastic member of the COVID Info Commons project team. Um, as we mentioned already, the COVID Info Commons or KIC is a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. Every month, KIC brings together scholars from all over the country to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. Each scholar will also engage the community directly by answering your questions about their work. Um, but before I introduce you to today's fast, fantastic group of uh, speakers, I'd like to first invite Florence, um, our executive director, to just say a bit more about the kick and uh, introduce us to this great program. Thank you so much. So this is what you will see if you go to covidinfocommons.net. This is the front page to the COVID Information Commons portal. And the COVID Info Commons serves as an open resource to explore NSF funded research addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. The really great news is that we're starting to look at how to bring NIH award information into this as well. So what you'll find is that today in our webinar, as well as future webinars and last month's webinar, we have NSF and NIH PIs, principal investigators that are presenting their research, which is wonderful because this is funded by the Convergence Accelerator and we need to look at how we work together to attack some of these challenges we have like the COVID-19 pandemic. When you go to the COVID Info Commons, you'll be able to find in the uh, NSF COVID Awards and PI database, you can put in a keyword for a type of award like epidemiology, you could put in somebody's name, um, and you could actually search on many different ways about about a thousand, actually 990 NSF COVID awards, soon to be thousands hopefully of NSF and NIH awards. You can also click on the Research Explorer map tool, which actually uses machine learning to cluster the awards into different categories. And you can can also find over 50 global data sets and opportunities and resources in the Meet the Researchers area. You can actually look at the particular lightning talks by each PI, so you can put their name in and see their lightning talk. And you can also look at the blog, the events, see our project team, and look at groups and guides and actually the student paper challenge as well, which you're going to learn more about because I've, we have one of our student paper challenge winners presenting today, which we're really delighted about. So that's a little overview. Uh, we're very grateful for the NSF support from the Convergence Accelerator Program for this rapid award. And we're very grateful for their support um, and NIH's support of all the PIs who are with us today. So thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, Florence. Um, so now I'd like to introduce everyone to today's fantastic speakers. This afternoon, we'll be hearing some from some researchers whose work focuses on a wide range of topics, from human mobility tracking to predicting COVID immune responses and possible de decontamination processes. Um, first, I'd like to invite Professor Abu Nike of the University of Delaware to kick us off. So I will stop sharing my screen. And Professor, if you'd like to um, get started, you're, you're up.
Let me share my screen. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the work that we are doing uh, with the Nemours Children Hospital on predictive modeling and optimal control uh, framework for model-based epidemic response in Delaware. Uh, by definition of a lightning talk, things will go by very quickly. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at the end. Our objective is to develop and evaluate a predictive modeling approach that can be applied to the spread of SARS-CoV-2, but able to adapt it to emergent infectious diseases later on, especially for children. Uh, we're focusing on the state of Delaware right now, and we'll talk a little bit about the optimal uh, model-based mitigation strategy toward the end. I don't need to tell this audience about mathematical modeling and how it has become a standard tool in the arsenal of practitioners. And there have been various approaches to COVID-19 modeling, which we don't have time to go through, but I will then motivate why we're taking the approach that we're taking. Uh, we're using the concept of chemical reaction kinetics. When uh, a species comes in contact with another species, they react. Uh, but by using this framework, it allows us to do several things that we may not be able to do uh, otherwise. Uh, so for example, we have this concept of residence time distribution, which helps us characterize how much time a molecule spends inside of a reactor, which is somewhat similar to the time it takes for a person who's been infected to recover or to die. So it's those kinds of things that we uh, use. This is probably the, the most important slide at this point uh, to give you an idea of the mechanism. So uh, if A in red represents someone who's infected, comes in contact with someone who is not infected, you get two infected people. At the rate of transmission is case of T. And then that person can recover, but goes through an intermediate stage where you're still infectious, and then you become completely recovered. Same thing, unfortunately, for death, intermediate stage where you can still infect people, and so on and so forth. The secondary transmission is somebody who's on the way to recovery or someone on the way to death can still infect other people. And then if you Imagine that everybody who's been infected and who's on the way to getting well or on the way to dying is in some uh, reactor. They take some time before they escape to recovery completely or to death completely. By doing it this way, we can characterize this with a set of uh, state equations that chemical engineers will, will recognize. And, uh, but the most important thing from this framework is we recognize that not every person that has been infected has been identified as such. So when we take a measurement, measurement we take is only a fraction of the people that have actually been infected. Uh, and so by incorporating this into this model, it allows us to be able to develop a model. I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details, but uh, from the model, how do we determine the parameters? We take data, uh, training data, and we use least squares optimization to obtain these parameters, this, this rate constants, and we reserve the most recent week of data for validation. In other words, if we had three weeks of data, we use the first two weeks of data, to fit the models, and then we try to predict what would have happened the third week as if we didn't have that and use that to do validation. And then we repeat this every week, moving the origin of the validation data for a moving horizon uh, uh, situation. So here is what happened uh, for us at May, May 23rd. The blue line, uh, the solid blue line is the seven day moving average the data with a lot of noise, obviously, this is uh, daily recorded cases is, is all over the place. Our model prediction at the time is this classic uh, curve that, that, that people are familiar with. And so this is what we were thinking of on May 23rd, and we were really feeling good that maybe things would uh, uh, be, be uh, finishing by, by the end of July. This is the cumulative data. Uh, you can see what we used to fit and what we used to, to uh, 
uh, validate. Uh, this is the percent of uninfected people. These are the results that we obtained at that time and the prediction of the final population of in, uninfected and so on and so forth. The most important result at the time was that we estimated a total infected uh, percent infected that was unidentified as 30%. And actually that has been si since, it was since confirmed that uh, only about that much at that time was, was uh, uh, in, uh, was identified as infected, which meant that 70% were asymptomatic or presymptomatic or symptomatic but untested. And, and all of that started to argue strongly for random sampling to be able to detect the asymptomatic and then do something about it. Uh, let me just jump real quickly to what happened in September 27. And as you can see, we did some pretty stupid things in the sense that we didn't pay attention and we had a second wave when we had a third wave and our model was able to adapt and keep up. And uh, since then, uh, we've actually had a, a, a fourth wave. And, and I'm just gonna show you how our model was uh, keeping up. Again, keep your mind, uh, keep your eye on the, uh, the, the curve itself. The solid blue line is the seven day moving average. And so we've been tracking it fairly well and all of the things that are going on. And uh, it's, it's probably important to show you some estimates of the rate of transmission. And so this is what's happened over the last nine weeks by the last time that we, we checked, you can see that the rate of transmission was starting to go down and it's starting to ick back up again. And so I, I hope we don't have some really serious issues again. Now, the, the part that you may not have seen before is the fact that we can actually do active intervention. When we do random sampling and contact tracing and we find people that are infected, we quarantine and we treat them. This is the mathematical equivalent of introducing this function U of T, which unfortunately I don't have the time to explain to you how we obtain this. But if you give me a fraction of infected, a start date for, the, for going out to sample people and, and the sampling period and the total population and the fraction of the population, we can determine uh, what to do to uh, meet some objective that you can say. Let me just show you some results. That's the equation you will see. So for example, if at the very beginning in the state of Delaware, at the very beginning, 30 days after, if we had sampled every week and we took a 0.02% of the population of the state of Delaware, that is the number of people that we sample and we test, and for an initial a uh, fraction of infected people of 0 0.01, here's what we would have seen. We could have shortened, this is not flattening the curve. This is changing the curve completely. We would have brought things back by about 15 days and about a 50% reduction if we had done this uh, 30 days. Now, why are we doing this now? We're saying the next time something happens, <laughs> we will know what to do, how to do it, and things so that look like. The red curve is what would have seen instead of the blue curve. We have uh, handled things. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there are many, many parameters that we can select. So there are different ways of achieving the same objective. And so as is typical, you'd show a contour curve. So for example, if we wanted to bring the, uh, the, the uh, COVID infection down to uh, a, a less detectable value in 100 days, we can achieve that by doing a sample size of, of 0.15, sampling seven uh, every week. And, and uh, so anyway, this, these are some of the results that we've obtained. I'm gonna skip this because it's really not, this is what, just to show us that if you don't start early, it becomes more difficult to be able to get things done. So let me summarize and conclude. We've used a chemical engineering reaction kinetics based model for COVID-19 spread. We've applied it to the state of Delaware, but we haven't shown you the other data sets that we've applied it to. Uh, we've used the model to study the effect of active in intervention. We're now developing a recursive approach uh, for children and that we're gonna develop a, a, a platform that uh, decision makers can use. I'd like to acknowledge my postdoc, Yu Luo, who now has a real job with GlaxoSmithKline and we have two grad students working with uh, Rob Akins and with me, Neha and Jonathan, and Julie Cart is the computer scientist working with us. That's it.
Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor, for sharing your research with us. And I'm sure our audience members have many questions for you about this presentation. So as a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you can just um, hang on to your questions, we'll be doing a group Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. But in the interim, if you um, would like to submit any questions, you can do that in the chat. Um, but for the moment, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Eugene Richardson. Uh, Professor Richardson, you're welcome to share your presentation. All right. Thanks so much to the organizers and for everybody for joining us today. Um, I will be presenting uh, an interesting collaboration, which is essentially the, funded by my K award um, from NIAD, and it is the uh, National COVID Zero Survey from Sierra Leone, which we'll, we just submitted for publication and is actually the first nationally representative antibody survey for COVID from the African continent. Um, I originally had a grant for the social epidemiology of Ebola which I've been working on for the past four or five years, and then converted the grant to COVID. Um, and then when in last February, when John and Kengasong from the Africa CDC prevent, presented uh, the continental vision for COVID containment uh, for African Union member states, we all combined our efforts um, to uh, design zero surveys for a variety of countries. And, and Sierra Leone happened to be the one to um, finish first. And so here's part of our team um, going out to some of the outer islands for this uh, random survey. Primary objective was to define the age and sex specific zero prevalence of COVID in the general population up till March of 2021 uh, when we conducted it. And then a secondary objective was to uh, identify risk factors for zero positivity. The previous research had shown um, in 5.2% uh, prevalence in Kenyan blood donors. They actually recently re released a, a preprint during the third wave saying uh, that there was a 48% prevalence, but this is only in blood donors, so it's not representative and they're not using a very good assay. Other studies have looked at healthcare workers and found a variety of seroprevalences from 12% in Malawi to 45% in, uh, in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, we had been hearing this. I was, I was seconded to the Africa CDC uh, last August, and we were hearing from our colleagues that lots of people were dying, uh, elderly people dying from pneumonia, but they weren't recording or testing them for COVID. And so um, part of the aim of this study is to understand what underreporting might look like. So we improved on the previous studies by using a better performing assay and then enrolling a nationally representative sample. Um, we found that we needed about 1,200 households for power. Interestingly, uh, uh, this is a quick aside, I'm involved in a, a project at UCSF where um, uh, cases of COVID are identified and then we essentially go to the, their houses and if they have people living with them, we enroll them in all the household members and we bring them a freezer and put it in their, in their uh, garage. <laughs> Uh, where they take daily samples, nose, saliva, and uh, fecal samples and freeze them. And then we come by and get blood every five days. Um, and that study did not need IRB approval. It's as invasive as it was and, and there are all sorts of identifiable data because it's public health surveillance. And I thought this was going beyond public health surveillance, but they were adamant, UCSF was adamant that this did not IRB approval. So same with this study of the Ciro survey, it's public health sur uh, surveillance, Harvard uh, gave it a not research determination, but Sierra Leone did want to review it and they gave us uh, their IRB approval. Africa CDC provided the kits and support for field teams. And then again, we conducted it in March. Um, so what we did was we asked Statistics Sierra Leone to uh, give us 120 uh, randomly selected enumeration areas. And they're kind of like census tracts of uh, 80 to 100 households. Then we took a satellite map of each one, numbered the houses, numbered the rooftops, and picked 10 random households. We picked one to two people per household, and we, we had to uh, constrain it because there's a large amount of young people uh, in uh, African Union member states, and if you just pick randomly, you would get a lot of young people. So we had to constrain it so that we could get uh, 
um, uh, an appropriate amount of across the age uh, cohorts. And then we collected uh, capillary blood with finger stick and used this uh, bio, right sign bio test, which was shown in FDA testing to have 100% combined sensitivity and specificity. We also did a local um, uh, uh, assay, uh, local testing of the assay and found the same numbers. And this is important because when, when I was running the uh, Ebola surveys, we found that uh, for the assay we were using, the negative controls in Europe and America had zero signal, but negative controls in Western Africa had all sorts of signal, presumptively due to circulating pathogens that we haven't even identified yet. And so it's a reminder, it's important to use negative controls from the uh, local area because it can change the thresholds for, for your testing. So uh, here's the demographics and um, we, uh, I'll show you the preprint so you can look this up. But here's the important results. Uh, the unweighted seroprevalence was low at 2.8% overall. We found that it wasn't quite random in some of the outer rural districts. So we weighted it um, and so got an overall weighted of 2.6%. You can see the rest here. Um, an important uh, finding was that rural, rural and urban were different, which is most places show something similar. It was 4.2% 4, 4 in the uh, urban capitals. Um, and that difference was st statistically significant. Um, and so the finding, um, you know, of 2.6% of the population being exposed means that an estimated 218,000 people were infected out of 7.8 million. And this is actually not that high compared to regional estimates, uh, you know, uh, even though no one's done a nationally representative zero survey. The important thing is that this is 43 times higher than what their case reporting is. Um, and so it means a couple of different things. One, it indicates that the um, that herd immunity is far from being achieved. And even if they had herd immunity, uh, you know, it probably is not as uh, helpful for the Delta variant that is now coming through in a third wave. And although it, it was low compared to Europe and the Americas, again, this uh, it, it's it indicates enormous underreporting, And this has strong, uh, significant ramifications for what's going on across the continent, um, which is experiencing a third wave. In Sierra Leone, they're now reporting around 90 cases per day. And if the same underreporting from two months ago is occurring, which I think it is, it actually means there's about almost 4,000 cases per day. This also means that presumptively regionally, uh, the reports we're getting that you know, they're experiencing a, uh, a significant third wave are probably hugely underreported. Um, and so, so it means that um, you know, we, containment efforts have to be strengthened, uh, but at the same time, it, it points to the problems of vaccine nationalism slash vaccine apartheid, like what, this is, what the ramifications are for places like India and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that they've, you know, Sierra Leone's only been able to get enough vaccines for 0.2% of its population. So here you can see evidence of the first wave, second wave, third wave. Um, we multiply all these by 40, and then you start to get an idea of what the real burden of uh, COVID cases are. So they should, uh, these data should strengthen um, uh, demands for fa faster vaccine deployment um, and uh, support for intellectual property waivers and technology transfers. Um, we have some articles on that in BMJ Global Health. Um, and then Sierra Leone should also aim to strengthen active surveillance. And we've been sharing these data because you know, Ministry of Health people were involved. Um, and even with the Africa CDC, what the ramifications might be for other countries. Quick on the limitations, you know, we're not sure the effect of waning immunity on the assay since only uh, the controls were recently infected people. And then the exact sensitivity for minimally symptomatic infection is not necessarily known. So here's the preprint. Uh, you can find it on MedArchive and it's under review at The Lancet currently. And then I'll just end by a quick plug for work that I do as, uh, so my PhD is in anthropology and I'm in, a, I'm in a department of global health and social medicine. So what I often do is use data like this to, to see what the, just, the underlying justice claims are. So here's a recent book I've written um, on the coloniality of global 
public health. We, it has strong critiques of how we use big data, causal inference, and infectious disease modeling, um, and how a lot of those efforts often support status quo relations of inequality. Um, here's another paper we did um, as part of, um, I'm the co-chair for the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. We did some anti-racist modeling to look at what rep reparations played to, uh, paid to Black American descendants of persons enslaved in the U.S. might look like on um, SARS in this, SARS-CoV-2 in this country and found that it could be 30 to 60 percent less. Um, and since this is not about that paper, I'll just leave it to you. I'll put it, uh, links to it in the chat. Um, but Thanks very much for your attention and look forward to the uh, discussion at the end. Thank you very much for sharing this research with us. It's um, very insightful, very interesting. Um, next, let me allow or uh, introduce um, Dr. Alex Lai of Cornell University. Professor, uh, please feel free to share. The floor is yours. So, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for the organizers. Uh, so my topic is about the uh, SARS-CoV-2 fusion peptide, which is uh, more like a biophysical study. So, <clears throat> so this is the uh, how the SARS virus uh, enter the host cells. So basically, it is a common. Uh, it's a common process uh, shared by a lot of uh, envelope virus. So the virus first attach to the cell membrane receptors, and then they will possibly go through two pathways. The first one is to uh, go through the plasma membrane. So there is a fusion between the viral em envelope and the plasma membrane. And then the second one is the virus first engulfed by the host cell go to go into the endosome. And then the fusion between the endosomal membrane and the viral envelope will release the mat uh, genetic material into the host cell. So during this process, uh, the spike protein or other uh, similar proteins on other virus are very important. So basically the spike protein is a trimer of the S1, S2 hetero uh, heterodimers. So the, uh, the S1 is basically responsible for the binding uh, of the receptors. And then the S2 subunit is uh, responsible for the membrane fusion. So as we can see in here, uh, there is a very small part, which we call the fusion peptide, that's actually inserted into the membrane. And this insertion is very important because it will initiate the membrane fusion. And this is a required step in the viral infection. So that's why we need to find out the mechanism of how this fusion peptide interact with the membrane and how they initiate the membrane fusion. Uh, the method we mainly use is the we call it ESR, which is uh, a magnetic spe uh, a spectrometer method. So basically, uh, that we want to put some uh, spin free spin labeled uh, liquids onto the membrane as we're showing here. And then uh, this beam will locate on different uh, position in, in, the, in the membrane. And then we mix the fusion peptide with the membrane and detect the change of the structure of the membrane, which is reflected by the spectrum. So we collect this, this spectrum, and then we repeat this experiment uh, in the condition of different peptide concentration. And then from this spectrum, we uh, do a simulation and then we extract the parameters. So one of the most important parameters in this study is called the order, order parameters. As you can show in this figure, if the concentration of the peptide increased, and then uh, the, this S not very increased as well, so there's the X type of jump. We have repeated this experiment for a, a wide range of uh, virus uh, fusion peptide. And what we find is that the active uh, fusion peptide will induce this S jump, S shaped jump, while the mutants and then the, uh, the, the non-active mutants cannot induce this kind of, uh, of jump. So what we think is that this membrane ordering effect uh, is a prerequisite for the membrane fusion in the viral entry process. So uh, when it goes to the SARS-CoV, uh, 
glycoprotein, the, the X protein, then the, it's a little bit difficult to determine which part is the fusion peptide because the, for the SARS-CoV, the S protein has several distinctive uh, cleavage size. So the most important are two that what we call is the S1, S2 side, and then the S2 uh, prime side, which are uh, located okay here. So uh, the first thing we need to do is to determine which one is the real fusion peptide. So, and actually for, we have several candidates and then for these candidates, uh, if we put it in the artificial system, they can uh, induce a kind of uh, artificial membrane fusion. So it's very, it's not very effective. They use the traditional method. That's why we think the membrane ordering can be a criteria to distinguish which one to identify the real fusion peptide. So what we found here is that uh, the, the FP1 it can show a very significant jump, while the other two candidates cannot uh, have this kind of uh, uh, this uh, certain degree of increase. So, and then we finally uh, can identify, determine that the FP1 that is immediately after the S2 prime position, cleavage side is the real fusion peptide. And during this process, we also found a very interesting thing that is quite uh, not, not uncommon. Uh, it, in the, in the virus that is, uh, is dependent on the calcium. So as you can show here, without the calcium, there's no, no, this, uh, no big jump. And then in here, if we fix the concentration of the fusion peptide and increase the concentration of the calcium, you can see the calcium significantly increase the ability of, uh, for the fusion peptide to induce the membrane ordering. And then when it goes to the uh, SARS-2 fusion peptide, we first compare with the SARS, the sequence with SARS-1, SARS-2, and then the MERS, and we identify the homologous sequence of the SARS-2. And then we think that is the SARS-2 fusion peptide. And then we do this experiment and we really found that it can also induce the membrane, uh, mem membrane ordering and in the condition of the, in the calcium. And then we compare the uh, ability to induce the membrane ordering between the SARS-1, SARS-2, and the MERS. And we found that the SARS-2 has the higher uh, activity. And we also have detected the, ca the calcium dependency, uh, dependency of the SARS-2 fusion peptide is very specific, as we can show here. The other ions do not have, uh, cannot induce the uh, membrane ordering as much as the calcium. So, and um, with some other method, we can also know that one uh, SARS-2 fusion peptide binds two calcium ions, and then the interaction between the SARS-2 fusion peptide and calcium is stronger than those uh, of the SARS-1 and MERS fusion peptide. And we also uh, go one step forward that is from a separate fusion peptide to the whole spike protein trimer. So remember that the fusion peptide is only part of the whole protein. And we need to know whether the whole protein, the fusion peptide domain of the whole protein functions as uh, the separate fusion peptide. So what we use is a pseudo Thai virus particle, which we call PP, which express the spike protein trimers on the membrane. And we use this to interact with the, uh, the SUV which have the spin label on the membrane, and then we detect this uh, the increase of the membrane ordering in a, in real time. So as we can show here, after we trigger with the calcium, we can uh, find out the, the jump. And then if we use some other uh, ions that we cannot observe that. So that means that the whole S protein trimer anchor on the membrane also induce the membrane ordering as the uh, fusion peptide and also is a very specific uh, calcium dependent fraction. So this is a, a conclusion. Then the, uh, the SARS-2 fusion peptide locates in the downstream of the S2 prime cleavage site. And it can induce the membrane ordering in the calcium dependent fraction and it binds to the calcium in specifically in a one peptide to two uh, calcium ratio. And it has a higher uh, binding affinity and stronger membrane ordering effect than the SARS-1 fusion peptide. And then we also know that the SARS uh, S2 S protein trimer also induced the membrane ordering as the separate fusion peptide. 
So this study will help us to understand the mechanism of the viral entry into the whole cell and could also indicate how, uh, give some hints to how to develop a drug and vaccines. So yeah, this is my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for sharing that presentation with our audience. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, next, uh, we'll be hearing from Mark Riedel of the University of Minnesota. Professor, please feel free to begin your presentation. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. I'll be speaking today about computational work um, on the problem of uh, peptide binding. And uh, this is a collaboration with uh, George Westmansis from the Mayo Clinic. So um, with COVID-19, um, we've all heard um, that the disease is, uh, it behaves like any disease. There is a range in uh, severity of symptoms that people experience, but it's perhaps uh, more pronounced with COVID-19 than other diseases. Uh, a good fraction of people who contract the virus show no symptoms whatsoever. Most show either no or mild symptoms, but a significant fraction show severe symptoms. And of course, um, a small fraction show critical symptoms or even experience death as a result. So um, there are many factors influencing the disease severity and experts can speak better about this than I can. Um, age, sex, and in particular comorbidities are very significant and past exposure to similar viruses plays a role. But uh, a Part of the equation here in terms of disease severity is also um, the innate differences in our immune systems. And essentially the genes we've inherited from our parents uh, play a role in um, how well our bodies fight off this disease or most diseases. So our topic of study here is um, to computationally predict um, one aspect of the innate difference in an individual's immune system, the so-called cellular response. So the cellular response is the first line of defense that uh, our bodies have in response to any uh, viral infection. Um, it is the mechanism by which um, foreign peptides introduced into uh, cells are chopped up into uh, small fragments called peptides. These then uh, can be transported to the cell surface where they can bind to cell surface receptors called MHC class one molecules. If bound this way, the um, infected cells become targets for killer T cells, which can come off and uh, kill the infected cells, either killed from a viral infection, or as it turns out, uh, this is the most effective defense that we have against cancer. Cancerous cells are also killed off this way. This is the first line of defense because um, if it kicks in once uh, we're infected, uh, the immune system, the killer T cells can kill off all the infected cells before they have a chance to get going. But if the cellular response fails, then the infected cells become factories. They start churning out many, many copies of the virus and uh, other aspects of the immune system have to take over. So the cellular response um, is, uh, as with all aspects of immunology, complex. Understanding it is very important. Um, it's critical for uh, understanding and predicting the severity of novel viruses, such as SARS-CoV-2, uh, for vaccine development targeting viruses, um, also understanding the impacts of viral mutations, how different viruses um, will affect uh, different people through the, their innate cellular immune response. And as I keep returning to the topic for cancer immunotherapy, which is the uh, area of expertise of my collaborator. Like many people, we turned our attention to COVID-19 uh, and repurposed a skill set. So in this case, the computational predictions are originally uh, targeting cancer immunotherapy. So, uh, and of course, um, all of this uh, same theory applies to autoimmune diseases. So the cellular uh, immune response at its core is a, a computational problem. If we have the blue peptides uh, in the uh, figure on the right, this is the protein fragment associated with the virus. The question is, will that uh, blue peptide bind inside a groove or a cleft inside the yellow cell surface molecule, the MHC1 molecule? Um, and the uh, immune response then will be dependent upon whether this protein fragment binds and whether it binds well enough for uh, the killer T cells to recognize it. 
The blue fragments, they come from the virus. Those are novel. Um, so given a new virus, we will have a, a completely new set of uh, peptides. The uh, yellow cell surface molecules, those are determined by our genes. And uh, each individual has um, up to six different um, MHC1 molecules determined by our inheritance, three from each parent. And um, the cell surface molecules, the MHC molecules, are among the most diverse in our genome. There are uh, approximately 21,000 variants in the human population. This is no accident. Evolution has ensured that um, this aspect of our immune system is very diverse so that um, we've been able to uh, survive past viral uh, infections. Um, but this also poses a very significant computational challenge, as I'll describe. So um, the core problem that we're um, tackling is how to apply computer science to predict whether the blue peptide will bind inside the yellow cell surface molecule. And to do this for a very wide range of peptides, all of those associated with the virus, and for the very wide range of cell surface receptors, the MHC1 molecules. Now, there's been uh, a lot of prior work, computational prior work. There's been experimental work that, of course, has provided uh, molecular information on uh, the structure of these molecules. And the computational work that's been very successful has been to apply uh, machine learning, no surprise there for those who have a background in computer science, and neural networks. So there's a package called NetMHC that has been trained extensively on the experimental data with the binding strength for known pairs of the blue-yellow molecules, the MHC1 peptide pairs. And based upon uh, a neural network structure, this program can predict, given a new peptide, how strong it will predict. And this inference is um, based upon uh, simply peptide sequence. So the sequence of letters, uh, these are the amino acids in the peptide, are paired with a label that corresponds to the cell surface molecule, the MHC1 molecule. There's a strength, that's all the experimental data. And so given many, many thousands such pairs, um, the neural network can be trained. And once it's trained, given a novel peptide sequence, a novel sequence of amino acids, it can predict how well that peptide will bind to a given MHC1 molecule. So here the peptide sequence would be the blue peptide molecule in the uh, drawing. And the label would correspond to the yellow cell surface receptor, the MHC1 molecule. Um, this is great. And neural networks are powerful in the sense that um, they can be easily trained and they can effectively, uh, very effectively make predictions based upon the data they're given. But the limitation here is there is absolutely no molecular data whatsoever. Um, we're simply training labels and letters. And um, also the training data is taken for a very diverse set of experimental data. A lot of it, for instance, comes from um, HIV, a different virus and the peptides associated with HIV. And the problem is given a brand new virus like SARS-CoV-2, uh, most of the peptides have never been seen before. And a neural network will make predictions that are spurious because it's making inferences from a very different region of the peptide space. And so um, our approach would, is to do molecular level simulations. And of course, there's been uh, a lot of prior work on this topic. Very sophisticated molecular simulation techniques are known. Uh, and widely used. One is called molecular dynamics. Um, there are also Monte Carlo based simulations. Um, they use a technique called simulated annealing and molecular docking is another approach. Software available for uh, such molecular level simulations are widely used, but they're special, uh, they're general purpose. They've been developed for broad classes of molecules binding and they're extremely computationally intensive. Uh, to take a peptide and MHC1 pair and to use existing software to simulate it, it takes uh, days, sometimes weeks, to simulate a, simu a single binding um, event. Uh, so weeks of actually supercomputing time uh, to make a single prediction. And the scope of the problem we're confronting is we have um, 21,000 variants of the yellow cell surface molecules, the MH MHC1 uh, molecules. And for SARS-CoV-2, um, if we focus just on the spike protein and we chop that up into little bits for the peptides, we have about 38,000 of those. So we're talking about 1 billion combinations that we want to simulate um, in terms of the strength 
And if it takes uh, a week of supercomputing time each, we obviously don't have a billion weeks to study this. So our approach is twofold. On the one hand, um, we're creating highly customized software for molecular simulation. And uh, we're using uh, the details of the domain we're working in. So we're starting with the peptide. The peptides don't vary so much in terms of their length or their shape. We're starting with the peptides correctly aligned inside the cleft of the cell surface molecule, the MHC1 molecule. So we don't spend a lot of time just rotating the entire peptide in space. We place it exactly where it should be. And we perform the entire search uh, in the torsional space. So instead of moving the molecule around in three-dimensional space, we just twist and turn its bonds uh, to uh, try to find the optimal configuration. The, the other contribution is we're deploying this at scale. So we're using GPUs and then eventually cloud computing infrastructure to really throw computing power at the problem. And our goal, as I stated in the title, is to turn a billion days into a million minutes or perhaps one month of cloud computing time. So um, the challenges here, and I'll gloss over this, I'm almost out of time. Um, one thing, the experimental data is not complete. We don't have uh, full molecular models, uh, not only of all 21,000 variants, um, but we don't even have a good geographic spread. So this ties in with some of the pri previous talks. Most of the experimental data is for the variants of the MHC1, MHC1 molecules from uh, Western Caucasian demographics. So the other approach is we must infer the structure of the molecules and then simulate them. And so uh, final slide, the impact of this work, um, well, it's uh, relatively straightforward to um, determine for an individual what genes they have that code for the relevant molecules, the MHC1 molecules. It can be done through HLA typing, which is done for paternity testing. Given that information and given our computational infrastructure, we'll be able to predict for an individual how that individual will respond to a new pathogen, to a virus, to variants of the virus, um, for different individuals and for the effect of different vaccines on different viruses for different individuals. And of course, as I stated at the outset, uh, this work will apply not only to viruses, but also potentially to cancer immunotherapy and autoimmune diseases. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. I'm sure our audience will have plenty of questions for you about your presentation, Mark. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today's session. We're going to be hearing from Aditya Kulkarni. Aditya is actually currently taking undergraduate coursework at the University of Minnesota. He is one of three winners of the inaugural Kick Undergraduate Student Paper Challenge earlier this spring. And so we welcome Aditya. We're very excited to hear you share your research as an emerging scholar. So please take it away. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Aritya Kulkarni, and I'll be talking on human mobility patterns linked to COVID-19 prone locations. I'm going into my senior year in high school and I've been taking university classes for the past few years. The motivation behind the problem that I was trying to solve was that I was seeing during the early days of the pandemic and on the news that there are a lot of outbreaks at restaurants and bars and that there are significant spreaders of COVID-19. I also saw that policymakers were trying to find the best way to reopen businesses safely. So I came up with the question, that is, what is driving outbreaks at these COVID-19 prone locations? I then decided to take a look at the COVID Info Commons NSF Awards and PI database, as well as the Lingo 4G Explorer. And I was able to find a rapid NSF funded project that was looking at the efficiency of COVID-19 quarantine measures and how to improve those measures by comparing COVID-19 case numbers and testing procedures across countries that had varied levels of restrictions on mobility. Specifically, I saw two rapid projects that were analyzing mobility patterns. One was a survey of senior citizens about their daily locations and activities, and the second one had taken more of a big data-driven approach, and that was to find hotspots in isolated populations and a real-time location data set. From then, I decided to look into two main data sources that I would use for my research. The most biggest one was SafeGraph, which is a nationwide spatiotemporal visit data set. Just in Minnesota, it has almost 350 individual anonymized devices, which are primarily composed of cell phones, 
and they cover almost 90,000 point of interest locations. These visits are spread across 264 different business categories, and there are more than 6 million POIs across the US. The data goes down to the census block group level, and for my analysis, I use the weekly patterns, which are POI visits by their weeks and duration, as well as the core places, which has more information on a POI, such as the NAICS code and other factors. I also looked into the Minnesota Department of Health reports, and they had specifically named bars and restaurants that were linked to COVID-19 cases each month. In order to be named on this report, the bar or restaurant had to have an outbreak that's defined as seven unrelated cases from seven different households, where each case is someone who visited only one restaurant or bar establishment during that month. From then, I decide to, the best way to do my experiment is to better understand the cause of COVID-19 hotspots at hangout locations. So I develop graphs that are showing time series of long duration visits to bars and restaurants in four contexts as follows. These are through different periods of the pandemic as Minnesota had two shutdowns followed by two consecutive openings. There was also a middle period where all types of bars and restaurants were open as well as regular locations. I did this by comparing both outbreak locations and non-outbreak locations for two cases during the reopenings and for the regular periods between March and October where there was not much restrictions on mobility, I looked into a variety of durations that is being from 21 to 60 minutes, 61 to 20, 240 minutes and greater than 240 minute visits to these locations. On the right is a map that shows both the outbreak locations and non-outbreak locations that I looked at, which are around 75 locations. So my first results looks at the reopening of June and July. I had compared 15 bars and restaurants that did have COVID-19 outbreaks, which were listed in the report, and then 15 that did not have outbreaks. Specifically, I tried to keep fixed variables between both groups, and that is by having matched pairs so each of these locations had a prior, had a similar number of visits prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And they're also within a similar location. So if you're considering about these two locations being in a city, that would be a matter of a few blocks. But if they're in more a rural or suburban area, that would be in a matter of a few miles between both the outbreak and non-outbreak location, which was selected. In this case, I'm, I'm looking at only visits that are greater than 20 minutes, as these tend to be more riskier visits. That could be someone who had went inside a restaurant or bar, took off their mask and had was eating or drinking a meal, rather than a visit by I suppose like a delivery driver who was like fully masked and just dropping something off on the outside, which would likely not turn into a COVID case as there wasn't that much exposure. You can see that in the outbreak location within the reopening, which was in the first week of June, there's a rapid rise in the term of long duration visits. The outbreak location reached its prior level in COVID-19, almost 100% recovery. Whereas the non-outbreak locations that did not get COVID-19 cases had only went up to about 50% of their prior pandemic. Just these 15 bars and restaurants in June were linked to 783 COVID-19 locations in June of 2020. I also looked in during the August outbreak. This was during bars and restaurants have been open for quite a few months. So I specifically looked at bars and restaurants that did have the outbreaks. They're through four different durations. And you can see that there was a, there's a spike here during the month of the outbreak. So there was a spike in long duration visits in the same month that there was an outbreak at these restaurants. I also see a similar result in October where these are the 15 bars and restaurants that had COVID outbreaks in October. And you can see that there's this sustained multi-week rise in long duration visits followed by a subsequent retraction. After this, there was a shutdown of both indoor dining at bars and restaurants and a few other locations such as gyms. And this was due to a significant rise in COVID-19 cases across Minnesota. Then after the reopening was lifted, and bars and restaurants were allowed to have indoor dining. There was the reopening in June and I mean in January and February. And you can see that there was a similar number of visits counts prior to the shutdown. 
but after the reopening, you can see that there's a visible difference in terms of both the outbreak and non-outbreak locations. Ultimately, I accounted by both positive and negative examples by comparing outbreak locations with locations without outbreaks, while keeping many variables as consistent as possible. These being close proximity, similar number of visits prior to the outbreak, and a similar business category of both bars and restaurants. I ensured that these results were not specific to one bar or restaurant. That being, I used multiple groups of 10 or more locations to show that these trends are not just outlier cases, but rather a tendency of the entire business category. Thus, long duration visits can show that it can offer insights into why outbreak occur at certain locations and not others. For future work, I'm studying the long duration patterns among disadvantaged racial and socioeconomic groups using demographic data, such as that in the US Census. I'm also analyzing the correlation between long duration visits and the indoor atmosphere of locations in terms of the amount of air ventilation, distance between visitors inside the location, and the density and crowdedness, as that could shed light onto other factors seen in association with long duration visits. Gaining access to COVID-19 infection data for other business categories apart from bars and restaurants can strengthen the link between long duration visits and disease outbreaks at lo business locations more broadly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Aditya, um, for sharing your research with us. We'll be watching your emerging career in data science um, with extreme interest. Thank you so much. And thank you again to all of our researchers who shared their work with us today. Um, for the audience, just know that each of these presentations will be made available on our website, covidinfocommons.net, under a uh, tab called Meet the Researchers. So take a look um, and see those next week. And um, before we segue into the Q&A session of today's webinar, I want to briefly share with the group um, the lineup for our next event, which will take place on Wednesday, August 18th. Um, from noon to 1.30. You can register to attend this event on our website, so pencil that into your calendar, and we hope you'll join us then. I also want to share this information with the group. Um, here are just some of the ways you can stay engaged with the COVID Info Commons. Please check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter. We're also on Twitter and LinkedIn. If you have any questions or suggestions for our upcoming events, you can always email us at that email at the bottom, info at covidinfocommons.net. So now I'd like to open it up to Q&A from our audience. Some of you have already posted comments and questions in the chat box. Thank you for that. Um, I'll hand it over to Florence, who's going to be moderating this session. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you, everybody, for your presentations. They were just wonderful. And Aditya, I guess we'll all be working for you someday. You're in high school, and you've been taking classes at the University of Minnesota for a few years. So we were very excited when Aditya reached out to us for the undergraduate student paper challenge. She said, I'm in high school, but I've been taking classes at the University of Minnesota for a few years. We were like, whoa, get them on board. You know, we want people like you worrying about this now so you can fix this in the future. So we're really delighted and very proud of you. And actually, Aditya's paper is available on the Columbia Academic Commons, which you can click through from the COVID Info Commons website. So we have a lot of great questions, and I have some too, but I'm holding back because there are so many great ones in the chat. And I know that Lauren has been keeping track of them. Um, so she's going to uh, talk us through some of them that haven't already been answered. And then at the end of that, we will be able to open it up for further questions, but we'll take them from the top, I believe. So Lauren, would you like to get us started? Sure. So I think, again, some of the questions have already been answered. Thank you to our speakers for jumping in. Um, really appreciate that. One um, that I think we can start with is actually to uh, Jean, Jean Richardson. Um, I think, Florence, this was a question from you. Um, does the Africa CDC cover all countries, or is there any country-level support for COVID-19 vaccine approval or guidance, or does it depend by country? So the, the original model was just, you know, single ministries of health doing their own work. And usually they were allied with NGOs and um, or their, you know, former colonies, uh, former colonial masters like Sierra Leone would get aid from Brit uh, UK, Guinea would get aid from France. 
And so the Africa CDC, their continental visions to start to try to transcend these colonial relics and, and come up with the continental vision. So they actually support all of the 55 um, African Union member states. But because it's it would be make a slow transition, um, you know, the, the states still do a lot of their own, um, you know, they do their own collection, send the data to Africa CDC. As far as the Ciro surveys, they said that they made a general protocol. They said they would provide money and resources for any country to do their own Ciro survey, and about 15 countries um, accepted the, the resources and are doing their own work. Um, countries like Rwanda, which are better organized, are actually um, doing a lot on their own, um, calling for some support. But you know, Paul Kagame has recently launched an initiative to bring mRNA vaccine capacity to the African continent so that we don't run into this uh, scenario in future pandemics where the, the continent is unable to produce its own vaccines um, and is um, you know, going through a third wave. What are we now, a year and a half after the outbreak started? And again, less than 1% of the population is, is vaccinated. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited and kind of amazed at your passion and knowledge about all this in the African continent. I know there are some people um, that I've been messaging with that feel the same way and, and might want to reach out to you if that's okay. Sure, no problem. Great. If you don't mind, if you would put your email in the chat, if you don't want to, that's okay. They can email me. It's up to you. We're into privacy. We do cybersecurity too. <laughs> so whatever's better for you. I'll do that and I'll put our commentaries in BMJ on uh, the vaccine apartheid as well. I'll put the link. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Okay, Lauren, back to you. Okay. Um, I now have a question for Dr. Lai. Um, this is, uh, thank you first for an interesting talk um, on the viral spike protein. How would you imagine your fundamental understanding of membrane ordering induced by the fusion peptide could lead to better antiviral therapeutics? Uh, yes, actually I have uh, typed in uh, just now. Oh, did you? <laughs> yes, uh, but, uh, but you can say in here because our okay. collaborator actually has texting, uh, for example, some drug that has already been approved uh, for, for therapy, that's, we can test it whether it can uh, reduce the infection rate I mean, in, the, in the cellular level and as well as the animal level. Because, because the, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, the fusion peptide induced the membrane ordering in the calcium uh, dependent infection, if we can block the calcium channel. So maybe that is a way to uh, deter the uh, viral entry. And then another possible target is that the fusion peptide itself, because compared with the, the, uh, the S1 domain, uh, which uh, is most of the, the vaccine is now targeting, the fusion peptide itself is very conserved. The sequence is very conserved. So uh, if we can develop some drug or some vaccine targeting the fusion peptide, the, so that is another possible uh, way. And then the other application is that uh, because uh, there might be two pathway of how the virus go into the host, host cell. One is uh, on the uh, plasma membrane and then the other one is on the uh, endosomal membrane. So we need to determine which is the most effective way of, for the uh, virus going to the cell. And then uh, our method can also test that. Yeah, so yeah, that's the, the, the thing I can think of right now. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't I hand over um, a question to our final presenter from this afternoon, um, Aditya. We got a couple of questions from you in the chat. Um, I don't think you've answered them yet, but please cut me off if you did. Um, the first question that came through was, how can you know the infection came from the specific bar or restaurant visited and not from any other public interactions? Yeah, so I did also briefly touch on this in my presentation. In order to be selected in the Minnesota Department of Health, there had to be an outbreak at the location, which was around like seven, seven people from seven, dif seven different households that where that one person had only visited one bar or restaurant. So by keeping that measure in place, it makes sure that it may not be from some other place, but rather this focused place since there are seven people who are meeting these conditions. 
Well, thank you. I think that covers all the questions I see in the chat, um, but we can open it up to a broader conversation if anyone in the audience would like to unmute themselves and um, address the speakers correctly, please feel free to do that. And Florence, I'm, I know you always have questions, so. Oh my gosh, I always do. It's hard for me to control myself. So um, did, was Joanne's question answered on the uh, the sequence of CMS codes for COVID-19? Joanne, did, did you feel you got the answer to that already? Oh, she might not be able to speak. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about is a lot of people are sick right now. <laughs> Um, and we were talking about this a little bit before we were uh, we got started. And as you look at all the information that was shared today, and we think of the current practicality of you know actually two of the speakers got you know got sick or someone in their family got sick couldn't join us today. So what is it that we think is happening? Is it that our immune systems are you know uh, out of practice? Is you know Mark, I, I think you had some comments about you know germs that have been out there that nobody was that are still out there. Are there any comments on what's really going on from a practical perspective? So I, 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 not an answer, but a question. I've read articles that have argued both, that as a result, at least in first world countries, of be better social distancing and hygiene, we've avoided a really bad influenza outbreak this year. So that sounds like a positive. But I also read articles that argue a negative, that because, uh, pathogens like influenza haven't circulated according to the normal cycle, we may be hit by a harder cycle when things go back to normal. So mm -hmm. both a positive or a negative, maybe people or experts on this could comment. Yeah, well, I'm an infectious disease physician. Um, and, you know, we when we test for COVID, we test a panel, a viral panel, and we haven't seen any increase recently in flu showing up or RSV or any of these things. I agree that, yes, they, they could be bundled up and just waiting for when we demask and hit us with an, a big bump, but I, I don't think that's happening now. So uh, for people that are, uh, um, you know, reporting in sick, either they have COVID or just, you know, run in the mill stuff, but I don't think there's any, um, you know, hidden wave of other stuff going on. But I agree with Mark that we may be, uh, you know, we could be in store for a double whammy if uh, we relax uh, the mat, you know, the masking and, um, and then go back to status quo. Well, thank you. We like practical as well as, you know, practical research and transition to practice as we call it. So then let's get to Joanne's question. Um, has anyone worked with the sequence of CMS codes for COVID-19, how they were used in different settings and how accurate they are in various populations? Okay, I guess the answer is no then. Um, and so- uh, Thanks. Oh, hi, Joanne. <laughs> Any other comments on that? Okay, great. And uh, I'm not sure that Tunde answered this. Um, your model appears to be well mixed in the sense that cases are assumed to have no spatial distribution. Any thoughts on expanding your approach to account for higher or lower case densities at different locations in Delaware? I didn't get a chance to uh, address that particular aspect, but this is precisely one of the reasons that we're using chemical reaction engineering. Because uh, one of the earliest contributions, I mean, going way back uh, to chemical reaction engineering is uh, non-ideal non mixing. And so we actually have a framework for dealing with non-ideal mixing. Uh, for chemical engineers in the audience, we can have a mixture of uh, CSTRs in series or plug flow reactors or things like that. But the idea here is to start simple. And then when we see evidence, as we, are, as, as we do see once in a while, that the lower part of the state is characteristically different from uh, mm -hmm. the upper part of the state. And then we go into a, uh, residence time distribution uh, framework to figure out what non-ideal mixing uh, model will fit the data that we have. So uh, that's, that's in fact one of the advantages of using chemical reaction engineering as opposed to the traditional SEIR for people who are familiar with, with that uh, does not really leave room for uh, that non-homogeneity 
the, the assumption is everything is homogeneous. But if we, if we imagine that this is all taking place inside of a reactor, well, then we can have little pockets of, of different, uh, different pockets of, of, uh, of ideal mixing. And then say, for example, in the state of Delaware, the first thing we do is to say that we have two. Uh, one for the south and one for the north, and and then connect them into this big, uh, big, quote unquote reactor. But yeah, if if there's enough evidence that we need to do that, then we will. Interesting. And I think there was a follow-on question regarding the model. Has the model used a set of data to determine some parameters and then used the model to make some predictions? I think the answer is yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And and I, I apologize that I did not uh, make that as clear. Uh, because everything I've been showing was data, and uh, we were actually always predicting not just a week ahead, but we're predicting all the way to the end, and then we would uh, update our model. And uh, But the most important thing was that at the very early stages, we actually thought that we were wrong in thinking that only 30% of mm -hmm. the people that were infected uh, were uh, identified as such. And we went back and did it again and did it again. And he kept coming up with the same number. About a month later, it was confirmed that at that point in time, it was anywhere between 25 and 35% that were not, not identified. And we saw that in the early stages in China as well, it was something within that range. So uh, yeah, we've, we've put it against uh, data and we're currently We've actually used it I'm from Nigeria. We're using it to track what's going on in Nigeria. We've used it to track what's going on in, uh, in Philadelphia and, and things like that. So yeah, we're using real data, but where we're going with this is for children uh, because that's, uh, as you all know, children are not just little people. They, they, they have their own uh, uh, characteristics and things like that. And we're hoping to learn something uh, from, from applying it to data for children. That's wonderful. And actually, there are a lot of questions. People loved your stuff. You, you have a very nice presentation. So you get everybody thinking. You're very approachable. So thank you, Tunde. Um, so another question was, were there any challenges for the model to make it more accurate and more accurate predictions? Or were the predictions sufficiently good? You know, how much evolution did you have to do of the model as you, you know, looked back to how you actually did? Um, there, there were patches where the model did not do as well as we thought it should. And uh, one of the things that we, we are building into the model is recursive estimation. Mm -hmm. uh, because right now what we do is we take the entire data set and then we re-estimate. That's, that's not terribly efficient and it tends to smear uh, things. Uh, and so one of the things that we're hoping we'll be able to do is those discrepancies between the model prediction and the data, we want to capture those and use uh, some, depending on how large the data set is, use uh, data analysis to find out what part of the mechanism we're missing. Because it's, if, if the mechanism is correct, it will match it well. If it doesn't match it well, we're missing something in the mechanism. And it would be good to learn what that is. And I think, especially for children, we're going to find out a lot of things that we don't know. And it's that, uh, I, I'm actually excited to see when the data doesn't match the, the model, because then it will help us learn something. Totally agree. We always learn when we listen to what is not intuitive, right? We're like, right. why is that, right? <laughs> we always learn if we bother to listen to it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of interest, um, Jean, also in what you mentioned about the immunity linking of the Black American descendants enslaved and that of nowadays people facing COVID-19. And actually yesterday I was participating in the NSF Natural Hazard Center researchers meeting and there were some people presenting similar type of topics um, from the South and you know, looking back and looking forward. Um, and so how could, how could that imply? You know, what is it that you're learning? You, know, you can't recite your whole book and thank you for posting it in here um, and some of your, your new work and your papers, but could you talk a little bit more about that sure. uh, you know what the paper did was uh, some modeling uh, essentially what uh, the counterfactual being 
what would our COVID outbreak in the U.S. look like if reparations had been paid uh, mm -hmm. to um, people who are descendants of uh, persons enslaved in the U.S.? And the, the, um, I had mentioned that I'm chair of this Lancet Commission on, on reparations, and our section that, that deals with the U.S. is led by Sandy Darity, who is an uh, economics professor at Duke. And his approach is that the, the wealth gap should be eradicated because that is what the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, unfair credit markets, interpersonal racism has led to. Um, and the wealth gap is currently $10 trillion. Um, so with 40 million descendants, that's $250,000 per person. So what we looked at is if that had been paid, um, we used Louisiana as an example because they had good COVID data. They also had, um, crowded housing data. And then they have a binary kind of uh, black, white, uh, majority, minor or minority, majority, and not many other um, minorities in that state. So it allowed us to do this binary, binary analysis. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that, you know, if that money would presumptively lead to um, less overcrowded housing, um, the ability to social distance, mm -hmm. and, and less, um, less people being forced into frontline work. And just that intervention alone could reduce, have reduced r not for the entire country by 30 to 60% because the way we use these next, gen, next generation matrices and usually r not when you calculate it from those is dominated by the risk group, uh, the group with the highest risk. And in our mm -hmm. case in the US, it is the black population that has the higher risk, risk or some other states, it's uh, Latino populations. So just by reducing the risk in that one component, you reduce it for the population as a whole. Um, and so that's how we you know, essentially modeled out these findings. But the, the more interesting thing was that when it came out um, and it was picked up by like, you know, CNN and other news outlets, I have been receiving hate mail and threats since February for um, how dare you presume that we should pay now for something that happened 200 years ago to, you know, essentially the, the Mitch McConnell position when, you know, it became obvious to me that people don't understand <laughs> how these legacies are present in, in the current day. It also made me realize that dialogue with people like this probably isn't going to work, that we actually need legislated rep reparations. Um, and, and, you know, and you take everything to its log logical conclusion and you start to get to, you know, so voting for socialist governments, all that kind of stuff. But I'll try to keep this less political than I usually do. It's okay. Everybody gets an opinion. That's how we look at it. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. It's really, you know, very interesting. Um, there are a couple of other questions, comments in here, Aditya. So people want to hire you. No, I'm saying uh, somebody wants to offer you an internship. So you should read, look at some of these things. I think it's pretty yeah. amazing. And this is a, a great um, show of, you know, what the COVID Information Commons is. It's not just an information portal, it's a community. And people find each other through the portal. They find each other through these things. So Aditya, I would take a lot of notes on all these things that are in here for you. Um, I don't know if you want to answer any of the other ones that are in here. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I definitely appreciate the opportunity that this platform has given just to interact with other researchers and get to know the research that's there. Um, Wonderful. There are actually a couple of um, ideas in here, too, that you may want to take with you. Um, there's um, an they said it was an insightful study of bars and restaurants. Um, as I said, let me know if you're interested in a summer 22 internship in quarantine, quantitative biology, linking disease dynamics down to molecular and tissue level mechanics. Check out wid.wisc.edu. Sounds like the University of Wisconsin. Um, and then one extra data point they suggest is to try to check if these bar locations have their air filters checked. Um, in New York State, NYSERDA has done such tests for public buildings, but maybe bar owners can volunteer to have their filters checked check for viral load. And that's an interesting point between the built environment, you know, and the health, the health world and the confluence or convergence of those different types um, of research. Lawrence, may I ask a question? Please do, Tunde. Yeah, um, I, and I don't know if this is answerable by uh, anybody, but uh, one of the things that I'm starting to teach our students is the social, social aspect of problem solving. In other words, it's not enough for us as engineers to find the technical solution to a problem uh, or the financial feasibility. 
uh, the social acceptability of it is important. And I know that Jean probably knows this well by you know, going to Africa to do, uh, to do work. The question I'd like to ask is, there's so much vaccine hesitancy that is hard to explain and it's not based on logic. So if I'm working with people for the next pandemic and I'm working to develop a vaccine, are there people who understand sociology in this audience who can help us understand how we can uh, build that into what we do? In other words, I'm a little concerned about, yeah, I can stand here and say, come on, folks, what part of this logical thing don't you understand? Uh, and they still wouldn't do it, but then we're all at risk. So if we're to take responsibility for helping people like that over uh, get over this, what can we do as part of how we design our solutions? And I don't know if I got my point across. Oh, I think you did. It actually came up on a, another one of the calls in the last couple of months. Um, I, I don't remember which state he was from, but it was in the South. It could have been Alabama or Tennessee. And he was saying the same thing about vaccine hesitancy. And what we actually talked about is if there would be interest in creating like a webinar, like to talk about that, like a workshop, you know, let, and let's get some of the social scientists involved. You know, what's very interesting is the, the NSF uh, session I went to yesterday, the Hazard Center session with the Converge team, they are led by social scientists. So a lot of the discussions were about um, recovery from disasters and the social aspects of it. Very interesting. So you're absolutely right. That's, that's one of the reasons I think that one of the new NSF solicitations that came out around PIP, I don't know if you saw it, but it's a, a predictive intelligence uh, for pandemic preparedness, I think it is. Um, and they, it's actually funded across four different uh, directorates, including you know, social behavioral economics, engineering, computer information science and engineering, and bio. So we really do have to be working together. So maybe uh, what we can do, Lauren, we can think about it. We could you know, send an email out to the NIH and NSF researchers that we're you know, working with that are COVID related and say, and maybe some other of their friends in uh, social behavioral and economics and say, would you be interested in like a workshop, a brainstorming session? And actually NSF has asked us as the big data hubs, I mean, I think John McMullen's on the phone here, on the line here too. He's another, another one of the leaders of one of the hubs, um, have asked us to submit workshop proposals on things that wouldn't necessarily be right in the zone of what we do as big data hubs, but this is very related to that. So maybe that's a potential workshop opportunity that we could submit and maybe have a webinar on the way, you know. Yeah, yeah. John, Yin, John Yin just posted uh, a link to the, yeah. to the PIP uh, thing. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah thanks, sure. Lawrence. So there were four workshops this spring and the fourth one actually featured um, the social and behavioral economic uh, folks at uh, NSF and their uh, faculty colleagues who helped to organize that. Thank you, John. Always appreciate you jumping in on these things. Um, I can comment. Please. Uh, my, you know, I, I mentioned my PhD is in anthropology, so I do work on this, but I don't think I, I disagree with a lot of people that, you know, um, we're going to solve it by through dialogue with misinformation and like producing mm -hmm. pamphlets and better WhatsApp groups. I mean, that might help with 10 to 20 percent of it. But I think the differences are, are really structural. So you look at a place like Taiwan that is an egalitarian society and they had vaccine hesitancy or they had even, you know, COVID testing hesitancy. And all they had to do was some quick humor, you know, uh, put some humor into social media and people picked up on it and they dialogued and did fine. That will not work in a country as polarized as the U.S. Um, I really think that when you have such horrific inequity in um, income and by racism, you will never get to these to this. You, you'll never get vaccine acceptance until um, until we have those things decreased through reparations and socialist governments and things like that. Because it's always it's it's what the white supremacists use as they kind of um, they see their privilege being eroded. That's the way to fight back. It's very different for people of color uh, because their their approach is one that um, has been uh, you know distrust 
of, of the medical system, distrust of government, and that's something that could potentially be solved by reparations. But going back through the comments from Giannis about there being no vac vaccine hesitancy. So natural immunity is not the best way to achieve immunity. We've already demonstrated that if you get the alpha virus, um, you can get reinfected with uh, Delta and potentially future ones. In this case, unlike other infectious diseases, the vaccines, at least the mRNA vaccines, are better than natural immunity. So, um, you know, Brazil tried that experiment. They, they had 75% infected early on, and then a new wave came through and got everybody again. So, um, you know, the as far as av avoiding like thrombosis and all that kind of stuff, yeah, I think we should do away with all everything and stick with the mRNA vaccines. There's no there's no thrombosis with those. A little bit of myocarditis in young men, but it's such a rare thing, and you can treat it when they come to the hospital. That um, again, vaccinating far outweighs the, the small risk of those things. And then lastly, I think there was one more question about, uh, oh yeah, a person who's infected by animal coronavirus, is it possible their serology is positive? So that's a fantastic question. That's what I was getting to, um, why it's important to do local negative controls instead of just like, you know, trusting the FDA controls from U.S. Um, because they only use U.S. people. It's possible in um, in Africa that there are different circulating coronaviruses that might give false positives. And that is actually a, a reason people have, um, because there's actually a lower mortality from cases in uh, Africa. And we don't know if it's because it's just the younger population or there might be a little bit of immune, like soft immunity from other coronaviruses. But either way, we did a lot of negative control testing and at least the assay we used um, is specific enough to, to not uh, give false positives with uh, other coronaviruses. Very interesting, thank you. And there were actually one of the, I think it was one of the PIP sessions, John, was um, about zoonoses. So for people who were interested in that, you know, zoonotic um, issues with the animals and then the humans, you can actually watch an entire day of that, I think. Um, I spent quite a bit of time on that. I'd like to close this out with an aspirational couple of aspirational thoughts. Aditya, again, if we could put you on the spot, people are really interested in how you got involved in taking college classes, you know, when, what, were you like a freshman in high school when that started? And like, what got you started with that, inspired you, and how did that happen? And any thoughts you have on what we can do to improve STEM education so we can create more people like you? Sure, yeah, yeah. So essentially, my journey started in middle school. So it even, I had to take an exam in sixth grade to get into the university's, a university math program. And that was essentially designed for me to complete all my high school, all the high school level math up to like pre-calculus during my middle school year. So then in the high school, I would be free to be able to explore more higher up level math. And when most, most recently last year, I worked, I did multivariable calculus and I'm planning on doing some applied four year analysis um, my senior year. And mainly, I would say that my, mainly the work that I'd done at the university was more math related in terms of math classes. Mm -hmm. Although I am, I'm also gonna be able to take all my high school courses at the University of Minnesota. So for my upcoming senior year, I'll be taking all my classes at the university, but for the prior years, they were mainly for my math courses because I just felt I felt I kind of wanted a bit more of a challenge in terms of just learning and accelerating more newer math. And especially with the things, the relationships that I've seen between computer science and mathematics, that was always just both of those two hand in hand that I've always been like interested in. I think in terms, yeah, I think in, term, in, in terms of just the high school curriculum, I've I mainly, during the earlier years, I mainly stayed with, AP exams and I think the AP curriculum is pretty good but within the colleges just having having that connection to just real world research and what is the cutting edge um the cutting edge research that's happening in these fields I feel that's like important to focus on that during our curriculum even though like it may be a bit hard if you don't have like the prior experience but just like focusing on some parts that are related to what we're doing in school and just exploring it to what's latest in research. So then people will see that what they're interested in and getting involved with that. Well, you know, Aditya, 
we're delighted you're part of this community. You're one of our researchers and uh, we're here to help you. I know they're, they're standing in line. Mark is in line. He's very close. He's at the University of Minnesota. You know, Wisconsin's interested. So keep going and, you know, we're here to help you because we're really inspired by what you've shared with us and your, you know, your proactive, proactive nature of just going for it. So we're very happy and proud of you. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been a great discussion. I always learn a lot um, from the amazing researchers that present um, and the amazing people that join us to share their thoughts. We have these every month. The next one, as Lauren mentioned, is going to be Wednesday, August 18th. Um, we put the links in the chat here and you can always go to covidinfocommons.net and you can always reach out to us at um, info at covidinfocommons.net or go to one of our websites, you'll find us and I'm on LinkedIn. So it was really a pleasure and thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you, Lauren, for leading us. Thank you for our students from the Northeast Hub, Haley Stewart and Paula. And we really appreciate um, all your help. Please everyone be safe and uh, until next month. Thank you, thank too, you for, everyone. Florence. Thanks. Our pleasure. Yep. Thank you so much.